Good evening and most welcome to H906. Uh, this is going to be an easier lecture. I will try to keep it light and uh, sort of uh, recap some things we went through earlier, but also add a special new thing I discovered uh, while thinking today. I actually had time to think as well. I don't know how that works. Somehow it came to me, um, the name of the lecture or the theme of the lecture is Development, Learning, Understanding, Analyzing, Discussion are all about loosening up polarities. No enforcing can be achieved otherwise. And I would say this is maybe a very radical take on what fractality is. Fractality is understanding in a way, getting down to really see what it's about. Something, of course, that could be put in different terms and I call this, without the exogenous, all systems become unstable. And I compare to the steady pulse of our bodies. When the heart is taking in what is radically different, the radical otherness of uh, Levinas. Levinas or the do of Martin Buber, then it becomes stable. But a pulse that is regular and self-serving can never be stable. It, it, even, it is even that, that is a sure sign of an imminent cardiac arrest. And this goes for all system. All system to become stable need the exogenous, what is radically different. Otherwise, they will become unstable. In a way, this is also the message from deconstruction what Susie Froebel told us, and also what I began to realize with Tartan Tulko, trying to find how knowledge can be permanent, how it can be stable, and how it could be understood. And of course, this goes for the whole universe. There is a strange attractor that is completely dependent on the exogenous, keeping our own very galaxy together. Without disturbances, exogenous factor, the Milky Way would have fumbled into itself and become a black hole. And this goes for all aspects of our living system. They are exogenously dependent. They crash otherwise, or they go into something called regularity. Regularity and predictability are sure signs the system is no longer working. And interesting enough, this deconstruction is not rupturing the text in an essential way it actually gives the text existence and a possibility to understanding. And without it, no understanding would be possible at all. So I claim here, in contrast with my old teacher Anna Fournier, which I had some debate according to about deconstruction, she was very interested in deconstruction as well. She was a teacher in Spanish. And she saw deconstruction as one way of doing things, a special way, and that could add to the regular way. But I'm starting to understand it cannot be another way. It is either blocking the text or taking in the text. It's either that the system works, whether it's the exogenous world or the endogenous knowledge. For knowledge to be working, it cannot be either continuous nor uh, 
coherent. That is the start of knowledge not working. Goes for mathematics. It also goes for classical physics. And this is the entering of the exogenous in quantum mechanics. This is why Niels Bohr said, let's go back to observation. Because when we observe, we enter into the unknown, the apeiron or the significant differently things that are out there. And I'm starting to no longer, well, I, I'm not very much for discarding uh, philosophers, and I won't do that here either, but I'm starting to understand maybe the French existentialists weren't completely honest. It sounds so very honest. It actually struck me as pure honesty when they say reality is terrible and we need to accept everything's meaningless and so forth. I start thinking that is establishing a center as well and that they are somehow not completely honest with what they are doing. They are just contradicting what's around them. The philosophical environment that they were born in and they put a negative on that and putting a negative or solely, this is important, only reversing, it's not enough. And I realize now, I understood that with that very nice text about friends, because it was in the combination of reversal and also reciprocity. That combination made the depth come out. And it wasn't so much as completely discarding the old meaning, this crude meaning I mentioned. Uh, it was rather, uh, in lack of words, deepening that and understanding it better, getting close to it. And isn't this the case with the usual take on postmodernism, where people think well, there are actually those postmodernists, but this vulgarization of postmodernism that is all about turning everything upside down. That's a crude simplification. And I'm quite sure the accusation of, for instance, Jordan Peterson uh, about the postmodernist destroying rationality. It, it's just absurd, I think. And uh, Derrida would not be happy with the development in a university in Oregon and Washington, where they uh, threw out the teachers and uh, even threatened them and threw out the furniture by a willingness to turn everything upside down. Uh, woman before man, uh, different races turn them upside down, class against class educated against uneducated, that's once more a centric move. And actually, I would say there is no real difference between the will of Jordan Peterson, so to speak, re-establish a center, however that could be done. And why would even anybody want that? Or the new centrism of this so-called, they call themselves revolutionary, and not nothing but the immer, mirror image of the authoritarian tendencies they try to oppose. They don't add anything new, zero, zilch, nothing. And this is how I came to this understanding. It's a light hunch, it's not hinge, it's rather than a complete understanding. But it's going in that direction, and I'm starting to understand that all consistent systems are self-feeding and do not tell us anything. They are like they are. Uh, they can at best transmit something, but what that is, is very little. 
it is always already given from the onset. It's a sort of a loopiness going around here and I have the feeling myself and this does actually excellently explain why there is this renaming process going on. In sort of lack of anything new, of anything exogenous, what can one do except for renaming? And that's tragedy and maybe Sartre and Camus did the same thing. They replaced the logocentric centrism with disgust and what they call absolute existentiality, starting with the human being and saying the human being is exactly homo mansura, more or less. But that is, oddly enough, not going back to a more balanced state. Instead, it's establishing another center. And what is that center? Well, that, is, that center is what uh, Sartre and uh, Camus and others thought their take on what it is to understand the world. And of course, in a way, in that way, the only, uh, the only way you can take is just turning the things on. And that's rather handicapped, that's rather limited. And I mentioned that before, but uh, now I, I think I have more substance in my claim, negation is not that fancy. It is a simplification and you can put everything into negation. It's damn easy to criticize everything. It doesn't matter what it is, you can find something bad with something. Even the most brilliant car made by Tesla, look underneath and you say, oh, it's too big or it's too small. It could be anything, it doesn't matter. It's all happenstance and completely random, and it's not brilliant at all. This is like philosophy feeding of its own little limited knowledge. The little nutritions that are left in that system, uh, the system start to self-feed on that and spitting out these new things. Well, anyway, uh, have we seen in history any of these turnovers go anything in something that could be called positive? Well, for one thing, the French Revolution never led to any being liberated or anything like that. It led to more constriction. We got the meter system, we got kilometers, we got kilos, we got liters which is good in one case, but it also gives the, the idea that everything is the same everywhere. And that is the absolute opposite of knowledge. As Susie Froebel said, knowledge is always different. Not even the second time you take up knowledge will it be the same. If it is the same, it's nothing. Sameness is just an etiquette we put on things. It doesn't have any context or any co doesn't contain anything and the opposite doesn't contain anything because it's just the negation of it. Nothing. Nothing of value. We need to be whole again and that means body and soul and once upon a time we were whole and I think uh, there comes in a very huge message from Robert Magliola, Derrida on the Mend. Only the title of the book is quite amazing, but it is healing us, not only in our minds, but also our spiritual side and body side. Because there is actually no distinction in neurological perspective, it's the same thing. We are the same system, body, mind and spirit. And I've been noticed that more and more when I take in the environment, it doesn't seem to have anything to do with what I'm saying. 
but I notice my thinking clears up and it sharpens what I am able to produce. So those two things are anything but unrelated, not at all. While balancing up, you get the power once more to become a thinking person, a knowledgeable person. So it's like two things. Deconstruction leads to that we become able to access knowledge, but it also makes us sharper so we can find knowledge easier. So it's a double effect of the whole thing. Where there used to be division, we are going to find other divisions deeper down and they are more complex. They're not as simple as saying you are wrong, I am right. You are not smart, I am smart. Also, right. It doesn't help me and it doesn't help anyone else. It is just a position that blocks everything out of vision. This is something that's very prominent in this book too, as well. I'm getting actually uh, rather interesting in it. I had it in my uh, bookshelf for at least 20 years and it's always been connected with pain looking into it. <laughs> yes, I have to be honest. Isn't this painful in a way to look at? Because if I look at something, I need to understand it. And looking at things I can't understand have, have made my impatient mind frustrated. But I think uh, the yoga and slowing down of things have relax this tension on really understanding everything directly. I can now wait for it and it's also, I, I noticed that with music, it comes easier to me now. I don't have to get into that special mood and uh, it doesn't get so monotonous even if I listen to the same thing. It's a little bit having one of those really marvelous musical pieces and you reduce it somehow to just opposition. Well, there is the moment and here you go into Dur and here you go down to Moll. And that's a simplification. And many masterpieces both, uh, both by Bach and Handel are actually a combination, which makes them even more interesting. It could be on top, could it be a Dur thing? But slow down, it could be more than, it could be like a tonality and that makes it interesting. And sometimes the melodies go against each other. Like you find in Lully, it's called Contrapunct. That's also rather interesting. Uh, in page 33, he actually talks about binding through identity. These are the one of the things that Gachet mentioned that a possible outcome while looking into the mirror is that you get caught up somehow with what you actually experience. It comes from actual experience. It's not something in your head or in your body or it's not part, you cannot either say it's not part of reality. That's why the trope of the mirror was so powerful, because it is coming from reality, but that is not the only take of reality. And identity is okay, it's nothing bad in identity as well, but if it gets to be the only option, then it started to be problematic and binding. Uh, this is exactly what Gaget means. It's nothing wrong with identity. But if you constantly perceive that to be the only correct way of anything to be, then it started to become uh, strenuous. And especially if you look into the mirror and you look for identity directly, before even any chance of reality or exogenous things. Can you see here now? how the closure starts, starts with identity in a specific way that sort of closes the system off. This is 
may be a little bit parallel to Edward de Bono, how one becomes convinced one has completely right in everything. Or to, no, I shouldn't say that. Uh, let's say something here. Technology affects knowledge on a level so fundamental we may not easily notice it. The, technology, the, the, the technological model proclaims that knowledge is about ways to obtain results. How those results are to be applied is a matter for personal belief or conviction. The value or benefit of the results, the meaning in a larger context, is not presented as a question for knowledge. Just in that little paragraph, there was a lot of things. And this is supposed to be easy, but I will spread my whole lecture to end with this, hopefully. And I will say that it's most interesting once the technological model is established and put in place, we have one part that is on this side, so to speak, and that is what to do with the result of the knowledge. That's purely subjective. But as a whole, what does this knowledge do in the larger perspective, in a larger time frame? This is, this is very aptly put, it is not presented as a matter for knowledge. It is not part of the knowledge, what it is for. And of course, this sets in place a very crude limitation. So I can have only this type of knowledge. It makes products, so to speak. I would say this is a variety of owning knowledge. I have knowledge that is of practical use. The use I can use as I want to, but this very definition that knowledge is only for a purpose, that is a limitation. And that limitation in itself is not something that knowledge can look at and say, hmm, maybe that is not completely correct or maybe it could be otherwise. I started to understand this special mode of deconstruction is a little bit, as I mentioned earlier, with cause and effect in a long stream. The first time you take a look at that, it seems self-obvious. But then you get argument, logical argument, this is how it builds up, and start, you start realizing it could actually go the way out the way around. And for the linear time to proclaim its power, so to speak, it can only go one way. There cannot be an effect coming from, if we have cause and effect, the cause cannot come from the effect. And here it's an area, let's see here, there we have no. It's sort of an area that is darkened and it's like once the knowledge once is established this area is blocked out and that blocked out area is also the cause for its so to speak existence or way of being and by step by step in this rather tedious and <laughs> very very taxing way of presenting a question my logic gets into the matter and i start to understand there are some problems here and there is another man who's done the same thing but he's much sharper than i would ever be and that is julian barber he has also turned 
in other words, cause and effects upside down. And that is not done just by turning it. It is to realize it could actually literally go the other way around. It is I who say that I am here and I, unbeknownst to myself, I put it in a certain sequence. So the limitation is within myself. Knowledge can open that up and show to me that I am the intender of that specific sequence. And this is, as we mentioned before, very similar to... Um, mm -hmm. I had an example many years ago. <clears throat> and this is quite funny, you should put a light tune to this. Uh, it was Alka Seltzer in the 60s, they were to establish themselves in Saudi Arabia. Uh, what? Alka-Seltzer? Alka it's a it's a huge company. Alka-Seltzer. Mm. Ah, medicine. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, sort of light medicines, or sometimes it's just something you drink. Uh, they were to establish themselves in uh, Saudi Arabia, or uh, that's what they thought. So they had a huge campaign and they had, oddly enough, <laughs> three pictures. One was with a man with his face in pain. And then we have the alka cells aspirin it was, I think, in this case. And then we have this happy man. And part of the reasons for this campaign being constructed this way, in that time, uh, 60 to 70 percent of the population of Saudi Arabia were more or less rich, but they were not literate, did not read and write. So this is like somebody, something that everyone understands. Here comes the point. You could say that the area that in the marketing group, the area, each person in the marketing group, the area that it could be different was sort of blocked out. So we're not talking about normal blockages. I can't look at uh, rotten food, for instance. That's a blockage. I know it exists. And this blockage I have is something almost intentional. This is an unintentional blockage and it comes from knowledge itself. In a way, it doesn't come from the person, but it does. This very light blockage made it impossible to understand it could be different. That can only be done with a logical device. It needs to be of a certain length. So when they established this campaign all over Saudi Arabia, what they saw in Saudi Arabia that was actually a person who was smiling, happy, at ease, and then was the pills, and the last consequence, that he was in pain. So they could not establish themselves as selling their headache pills in Saudi Arabia. And they were actually busted for a couple of decades. It was associated with pain to take those pills. In another way, those seeing the signs, they didn't have the openness to check it from the other direction. So this would not have happened in China, for instance, because then they would look into the context and they would be able to understand anyway. So in a way, this is a harsh time, time a harsh term to call it fixation, because not fixation. A very light no knowledge comes in place, but actually that little no knowledge can have tremendous effects. It did in this case, it could be even more severe. I have some rather tremendous examples where it's so difficult, but they still have incredible effects. Actually, uh, the suggestion for Japan coming from the United States uh, was formulated in Japanese by a Japanese speaker, but 
looking at it in the situation, it can only be known by a politician from Japan. It sounded much more like an ultimatum. So it wasn't in the text. It was the text and what was around the text. So it was correct as long as it was in the White House where it was. But once it came to Japan, it took another effect and that helped to uh, lead the Pacific Ocean into war. And that was a war that took millions of life. There are historians who say this could be the only reason. It was actually, in English, it sounded more like we are up to negotiate. What would you say? It came out not on the paper in the United States, but in Japan as being, we leave you no choice. And you can see, these are not small things when it comes to the whole take. And put on top of that, there could be many ways to read this. It could be both at once. It could be like a whole gestalt. It could be read from above, under, from the hindsight. There are loads more options. And the idea with this logical structure is, so, so to speak, talk to your rationality and use that, well, I wouldn't say against itself, but to opening up broader. It could be the start of thinking. And this this really rises with me because I noticed that thinking has been going down. We are not as sharp as we used to be. So many tests all over the world show that we are lacking rationality. It could be these small things that actually have devastating effects. It's like limitations that go into our ideology or we mention a lot uh, the ontic contra the ontological, that is a vast limitation because actually you are only able in the ontic system to ask maybe one percent of the questions and everything that is important for you those are questions you can't ask not because they're prohibited because they are locked out because how the model looks like so opening up could have a, could be the reason why it's formulated in this very squarey way because it speaks to my reasoning powers and then it has to be rather strong but i notice already this is also opening up for the body because these limitations when they come to infect and they go into the whole context of the modern world, they cause us a mild stress. And that stress can develop memory. Uh, I will take more about that next lecture. Memory gets heavily affected. It became, becomes distance because of this specific way of looking at the progression or the regression of movements. So just by having this model, memories become distance and hard to reach. That might not sound so enormously, but put it into the context where you are. This is a test they made in the United States uh, not so long ago. They put elderly people who were in the early 80s into a room that was completely constructed like 1953. They got 1953 food, music, entertainment, newspapers and so forth. Everything to construct a model of how it was when they were young. Their memory and their cognitive powers or whatever this name in neurology increased enormously in just a week. This shows when this model is in combination with a very limiting context already and with the context that we think that
that memory should pass by age, which for instance is not the case in China, Japan, Korea, where they usually say that memory increases by age, that you get better. So it will affect the brain, it will also affect the aging of the brain. So there are many, many interesting connections. The body can never ever be outside knowledge. It's part of knowledge and it's not a physical body. We know that from body maps with uh, uh, the couple Blakesley. It is an object of knowing the body and the body is the thing we use to understand, analyze, intellectualize, do probation, uh, pro pretension and do, do, do ret retention. All those things come from the body. You either slide over to this side or the other side. Once in balance, you can just move a little bit, maybe a quarter of an inch, and that would be more than enough to do pretension. So it is a marvelous combination, and I think it's healing. Robert Magliola is absolutely right. Deconstruction heals our knowledge, our soul, and I would say even our world. And uh, if, if that wasn't happy enough, I don't know what. It is really marvelous. I think this lighter lecture should end now. Thank you very much for your attention, and I wish you a pleasant night. Bye-bye. Fantastic. <clears throat>